Our next speaker is Dr. Ratan Lal, and I think many and probably all of you uh, know of his pioneering and legacy work of pushing us all towards a soil-centric approach to understanding agriculture and, and the importance of soil health and soil dynamics. Uh, Dr. Lal uh, was the winner of the World Food Prize in 2020. And Ratan, we are so grateful that you were able to make time and join us. So I'm going to hand it over to you and uh, you can share your screen and, and take it from there. Thank you very much. Uh, please permit me to share the screen. Okay. And that has now been done. Okay, very good. Uh, can you see anything yet? Yes. You have a screen view now of the slide? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great privilege and honor. To begin with, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig for the 2022 laureate. And uh, this is a very befitting webinar in her honor. Uh, it's a very uh, joyful moment for all of us. The thank topic, you, <laughs> the, Thank you, Cynthia. The topic that was assigned uh, to me, uh, climate and soil carbon sequestration, <clears throat> what are key questions? Uh, I'm going to try to address uh, 10 questions, but before I do that, I will give a little background, which everybody knows that uh, carbon dioxide concentration since 1750 has increased 150%, methane 262%, uh, nitrous oxide 123% and still increasing. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a reason for uh, the CO2 concentration built up leading to climate change. For example, the total carbon stock in the atmosphere pre-agriculture are about 10,000 years ago, estimated at 360 gigaton. At the time of industrial revolution circa 1750, primarily due to land use for agriculture, conversion of natural ecosystem to managed ecosystem, it increased by 200 gigaton to 560. At present, it is approximately 880s. Some estimates are lower, but certainly gone up by another 300 and so plus gigaton, both due to fossil fuel combustion and climate-related uh, agricultural changes by several gases, CO2, N2O, CH4. The total emission from land use and agriculture since the beginning of agriculture is estimated 555 gigaton. Total emission from fossil fuel since 1750, about 445. That gives us a thousand gigaton, approximately give and take, of which 52% has been retained in the atmosphere. If you look at the uh, total amount uh, of the 1750 to 2020 emission, 290, 41.7% retained in the atmosphere, ocean uptake about 26%, and the land-based sink about 31%. I think that gives an impression uh, to anyone who look at the data that uh, land-based sinks do play a considerable role in absorbing anthropogenic emission, and that perhaps with some policy interventions, the word I heard, uh, climate smart agriculture, uh, apparently make agriculture a solution to the climate change. So there should be some focus on land basing, which means soil plus vegetation. Therefore, the critical mission uh, of the so-called climate smart agriculture, climate resilient agriculture, is making agriculture an important part of the solution. 
towards both adaptation and mitigation of climate change by promoting pro-farmer, pro-agriculture, pro-nature policies. I want to repeat uh, the last sentence part, promoting pro-farmer, pro-agriculture, pro-nature policies so that agriculture is integral to any solution to mitigation and adaptation of climate change. That brings me to discussion of different types of carbon. We have a gray carbon in the atmosphere, red carbon, of course, uh, fossil fuel combustion. We got green carbon, photosynthesis, brown carbon in soil, which is related to atmosphere as well as to that in the plant biomass. We got blue carbon in the ocean and coastal ecosystem. We got uh, inorganic carbon, which is uh, secondary carbonates, primary carbonate, bicarbonate. And of course, we have black carbon, pyrogenic, uh, related to uh, burning combustion. And uh, most of these are interconnected and human activities have been manipulating these different types of carbon. As a result, the carbon stock in the atmosphere, the gray carbon, as I said in the very beginning, has gone up tremendously from 360 gigaton pre-agriculture to almost 900 gigaton, increasing five gigaton per year plus because of uh, land use uh, conversion and fossil fuel combustion. So the second part of my talk, uh, the key questions, there are several. I will try to answer as much as I can. What is the link between soil organic and soil inorganic carbon, for example? Can they mutually reinforce when they're in soil? What is a soil organic carbon sink capacity? How it can be realized? How much more carbon can be emitted before it becomes a tipping point. I'll try to answer that. Is soil erosion a source or sink of greenhouse gases? What is the optimal range of soil organic carbon content in the root zone? What are the attributes of soil with a high carbon sink capacity, such as colloid content, clay, fine silt, depth, climate, land use, management, et cetera. How can the permanence of soil carbon be increased? So once it's put in the soil, it stays there for decades, if not centuries or millennia. And how much feedback can be caused by global warming of one degree centigrade through decomposition of soil organic matter? What are promising negative emission technologies, and what are the social, political, and behavioral issues that need to be addressed? These are some of the questions. I don't think I'm going to answer all, but certainly those that uh, are relevant to making agriculture a solution. That's the main goal of my talk. And uh, my other goal is, to make land-based sink a really substantial impact on drawdown of atmospheric CO2, there is no way that we have to return some land back to nature. I do hear call that population is increasing by 2050, maybe 10 billion, therefore we need more land. I am very strongly against that proposition. In fact, the solution lies in returning substantial amount of land by the end of the century back to nature. I'll come back to that in a moment. So all organic carbon and inorganic carbon are related. For one thing, they're both in soil. Organic carbon, different fractions of it, live biomass, undecomposed detritus material, the decomposed material, the protected, unprotected, dissolve organic carbon, particulate, Macroorganic carbon, various fractions. We got inorganic carbon, which is pedogenic and lithogenic. Lithogenic derived from the parent material, the pedogenic farm through the, the processes within the soil, and which can be carbonate secondary as well as bicarbonate. And of course, the decomposition 
of the organic carbon in soil, releasing CO2, which dissolves into carbonic acid and then precipitates with cation is a mechanism of formation of secondary carbonates. Many soils, especially those from arid and semi-arid region have both components. The humid region have a higher humus organic component, but the semi-arid soils and arid region soils have the secondary uh, carbonate as well as the primary carbonate soil inorganic carbon, especially at deeper depth, a very large components. Silicate weathering on a geological time scale uh, certainly leads to sequestration of carbon. In fact, that's a mechanism over a long period of time. And we are thinking using some of the silicate minerals such as olivine, perhaps grinding it and uh, distributing in humid conditions, tropical regions especially, uh, which will promote formation of secondary carbonates and thus the uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere. Groundwater leaching of the uh, bicarbonate is another mechanism. In many regions of the soil profile, uh, it is possible to visually see secondary carbonate, both as granule nodules, as well as sheets, uh, some of them as very visible crystalline material. That's about as much as I'm going to say about uh, secondary carbonates, except that it's a very important component of the global carbon cycle and needs to be studied more than it has been given the emphasis in the past. Let's look at the global carbon cycle on a short-term basis. Atmosphere, I already mentioned, approximately containing 880 gigaton, last year increased by 5.4 primarily because of the fossil fuel combustion of about 10 gigaton of carbon. In addition to that, about 0.8, approximately one gigaton carbon coming from deforestation and land use conversion. But at the same time, we have about 120, 123 gigaton photosynthesis and half of it, 60, is uh, respired back to the atmosphere immediately. The remaining goes to the soil and the soil respire back also uh, only small amount, maybe one to three gigaton remaining into the terrestrial biosphere. Accelerated soil erosion, I'll come back to that in a moment, in my estimate uh, leads to emission of carbon. Uh, the hydric erosion about 1.1, many uh, good uh, GMR, uh, uh, geologists and uh, those sedimentologists have estimated that some of the eroded carbon is taken to the ocean where it is sequestered into the deep water, which is very likely the case. But the net effect of carbon displaced from soil by water and wind erosion could be a strong impact on emission of greenhouse gases. Not only CO2, but depending upon where the displaced carbon drops uh, could be also methane and N2O as well. Not accounting the erosion moved carbon globally, what is its fate? Not accounting for it in the global carbon budget probably leads to erroneous estimates. So uh, on a global basis, ocean reserve about 2.6, uh, land-based sink about 3.3. We already talked about it. Atmosphere keeping about 5.4. Uh, we can estimate this budget on a farm basis, on a county basis, on a state basis, national basis, continental, global. Uh, it is understanding which is much needed so that we know what is anthropogenic impact on the global carbon cycle and how can we try to increase what is in the terrestrial biosphere, that the land, soil and vegetation. And hopefully we can decarbonize the atmosphere and recarbonize the terrestrial biosphere, which has lost almost 550 to 600 gigaton since the beginning of the agriculture. 
Human impact on the globe in carbon is tremendous, uh, 800 BC to 1750, approximately 320 gigaton, 1750 to 2020, another 235, total loss on the terrestrial biosphere, about 560, emission from soil alone, estimated somewhere between 100 and 135, and the fossil fuel emissions since 1750, 460. So the totals since 1750, 695. Total since beginning of agriculture, 1000. It's a very drastic impact, carbon footprint, the anthropogenic activity. One important part here is that this 555 gigaton that came from soil and trees can be, should be, must be part of it, maybe two thirds of it put back over time. How much of the time? That's a decadal scale. Uh, maybe by the end of this century, maybe even later, but try we must to put it back. How much carbon can we emit more from the fossil fuel before the global warming goes beyond two degrees centigrade? Well, we go back to the, the era of the uh, industrial revolution when the 280 parts per million, so many people think doubling that would always take us to the tipping point. So that's 560. The current level, May 1 statistics, 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. So take the difference between the two and multiply by 2.13 gigaton one part per million CO2 in the atmosphere, that gives you approximately 300 gigaton. So the carbon pie that humanity should consider very carefully how to divide amongst 8 billion people, or 10 million by 2050, how do you divide it? I think the Secretary General and other policymaker at global level should pay very much good attention to it. But more importantly, how not to burn even this much, how to find something other than that, solar, geo, hydro, uh, wind, whatever else you can find, which does not add carbon additional into the atmosphere. But at the same time, we create a land-based sink so we can create a drawdown. That's the philosophy. And that brings me to one of the other question, what is the optimum soil organic matter content? There is no one number, this is a range. Range depends on climate, range depends on soil, range depends on land use, but in general, soil organic carbon, which is about 50% of soil organic matter, approximately, uh, about 2%, one and a half to 2% is the optimum range, and the organic matter content would be about double of that, and crop response in a depleted soil, if the organic matter content is improved over a decadal scale, uh, would follow an example such as this with a maximum value reaching somewhere uh, between two to two and a half percent. Um, and most agricultural soils, especially those of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, the Caribbean region, the depleted land of the small landholders who use extractive farming practices is sometimes as low as 0.5% uh, of organic matter content, 0.25% of organic carbon. Organic carbon should be about one and a half to two organic matter, between two and a half to three and a half percent. Therefore, recarbonizing, restoring, improving organic matter content of the depleted, degraded soil should impact, not only have adaptation mitigation of climate change, but also soil quality, productivity, use efficiency of input. The curve that goes up when you change from uh, regular practices to those which are carbon positive, which lead to positive carbon budget is a sigmoid curve. And it begins with a flat, maybe sometime the 
rate might be constant for five years, maybe even longer, but certainly three to seven years. And this is sometime an issue, how to motivate farmers during this stage. Should they be rewarded to make sure they get over this stagnating part when the response is not very much? And once it gets to this S part where the slope is uh, more favorable to productivity, to use efficiency, uh, again, perhaps uh, the incentive may not be that critical, but continuing would be a good idea. Understanding the slope of that line. What is the rate of change of productivity per unit increase in carbon in the soil? I think that's a very important information and not very widely known. Uh, I have some data, but not as much as we would like to have. Therefore, the other part is uh, if we were to compensate farmers by whatever we call, I hope it's not called subsidy, but payment for ecosystem services, maybe carbon credit, uh, how much is that? We'll come back to that in a moment, but that is the period where that would be needed and understanding that period, understanding the slope and the time horizon is very critical. By the way, from this point where it began to rise and to where it flattened now, it might be a generational scale, 20, 25 years, uh, sometime even longer. So let's look at a low more closely when we change natural ecosystem to agricultural ecosystem. Temperate climate, such as Midwest United States, the soil carbon stock is going to decrease for many reasons, and this has been very well studied. Uh, in a temperate climate, it may come down to 50% of the original stock in about 50 years. I have monitored this curve for the tropical climate also, Africa, and this may happen in five to 10 years in the tropics, maybe even quicker if the soils are highly erodible. Some of the soils I was studying were highly erodible, and the carbon stock from 3% organic carbon to about 0.2% could happen between five to 10 year period. But at point where it uh, uh, stabilizes, because the erosion has been controlled, if the erosion is not controlled, the depletion will continue. If it's controlled, it may stabilize. And at that point in time, if you adopt better agriculture practices, there are many of them, we'll talk about that in a moment, the carbon stock may go up over time, again, following the sigma curve. It may reach first an attainable potential level, perhaps in a generational period of time. At that point, you find another better management practice and eventually maybe over 25 to 50 year period, 50 year period. It may reach the original level, may, rare cases. Not all cases, but rare cases may reach. And at that point, if we adopt something which is perhaps will improve more biomass production, in rare cases, it is possible to go beyond what the original level was. Example would be arid region, which had a water deficit. It could be acid soil with a phosphorus deficiency, with aluminum toxicity, uh, with a lack of basic cation in rare cases, but there may be possibility that may happen by and large, if we can get to the maximum original level, we have done very well. In ideal condition, probably, if we can get to two thirds of the original level, we have done very well. So when people call sink capacity, then sink capacity is wherever your carbon stock is now to where it can be under ideal land use soil management condition. From this graph, uh, take the slope of the line, you can calculate the rate of carbon sequestration, but it must be done on a curve which is on a decadal scale and not over a short period of time. We can calculate the mean residence time, pool over flux, uh, and we can also try to identify what are the land use and management practices which may create a positive budget. Conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, nature positive agriculture, many names are given to different things, integrated nutrient and pest management, biochar is considered negative emission technology, agroforestry, desertification and control, afforestation, 
uh, good posture management, water harvesting, drips of fertigation, complex farming system. There are many of them. But each one of these practices, and there is no one practice that fits all conditions, that's not possible. We have 300,000 known soil series. So one practice fit all condition is kind of uh, being naive. And each of these practices has their own carbon and water footprint. So calculating the rate from this slope minus what is the cost of doing business in terms of carbon would give you the net. And net is often not calculated. There are many mechanisms of increasing mean residence time, uh, physical protection of aggregation, organominal complexes, chemical recalcitrance, deep placement. The best process I can suggest is keep the ground protected, keep input of biomass carbon always added into the ground, into the soil surface, and do not disturb the soil. Keep the ground covered. Cover crop, crop residue mulch, complex farming system should not then disturb the carbon, which is already sequestered. This is a picture of my own plots, 1970, only 52 years ago. Uh, that was my first lesson on soil erosion. I had uh, contour ridges uh, done within a terraced land. Ground was beautifully plowed, uh, looked absolutely clean, bare. Corn growth was very nice. And then came a six inch rainstorm for 25 minutes. Uh, and that's what was left behind. The question I'm showing you this is the topsoil, that is where the organic matter content is concentrated, that where the erosion is most active, is also the light fraction. It floats over water with a bulk density of 0.6 maybe under ideal conditions, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. It is the most preferentially removed segment of the eroded particles. When it is being transported and redistributed over the landscape and the concentration time before it is deposited somewhere along the line, how much that time is, I have no idea. What is that fate of carbon? And that is a part where they're talking about erosion-induced emission of greenhouse gases. On a global scale, the total amount of carbon in topsoil, obviously 1,500. Uh, we estimate that on an erosional basis, maybe 5.7 petagram might be displaced by erosion, by water on an annual basis. And even if 20% of it is emitted en route to deposition site, that's the emission, only as CO2, not accounting for N2 and CH4. Quite a lot of it is redistributed of the landscape, but some of it, as I showed you before, 0.6 gigaton petagram does get into the ocean. Does, before it settles deep into the ocean, does it again get mineralized into some form of the gases or the other? Some of it does, but we do not account for it. I think this is, I'm going to come back for the end. Uh, we got clean water. Act, we got Clean Air Act, we probably need a Healthy Soil Act, just to make sure that these component of water-induced algal bloom and emission and transport of sediment be taken care of. So let's look at this segment of a landscape where because of the erosion, the very dark horizon uh, is lesser thick on the side slope. It becomes thicker on the depositional site uh, obviously, for uh, understandably, and some of it went into the stream and further down into the lake or the ocean. And this part here, which goes through anaerobic condition quite often, uh, is subject to methanogenesis, nitrification and denitrification. Therefore, if I were to look and monitor emission of greenhouse gases over this transect of a landscape, on the upland score, it will be CO2 and N2O on the uh, foot slope, uh, which got flooded, would be also CH4, and gaseous emission also happen in the stream. And they need to be accounted for. Um, and whatever is deposited is not necessarily uh, a sink. 
I want to mention something about dry lands, which cover 42, 44% of the total land area. And this land area is increasing. It is estimated to be 50% really by the end of this century. And this global dry lands, 80% uh, of agricultural land area is rain fed, which produce about 65 to 70% of the staple food. Water scarcity, already a problem, is going to probably aggravated with time. Uh, Cynthia probably knows more about through our modeling work. And the dry land, of course, are prone to climate change and uh, have their own issue of desertification. The UNCCD had just their meeting in Ivory Coast uh, last week. And a large proportion of population living there uh, have, have an earning income of less than $2 per day. Many people think that the uh, probably uh, afforestation of uh, desert is a good idea. Absolutely it is. But similar to remember, I was talking about those practices which sequester carbon. They have their own carbon footprint. Just imagine what the albedo is on a sand or a sand dune. And what is albedo when it has trees and green cover? So this green part absorbing radiation is going to upset the, the climate of the region as well because of the reduction in albedo. And that need to be accounted for. Uh, it may be small, but certainly something that cannot be ignored. So it's called albedo effect of forest. Not very well documented. And uh, it uh, can change the budget in a slightly different direction uh, and the impact uh, also happened in Boreal and other regions, but certainly more in uh, deserts such as in the Sahara region. Now we come to negative emission farming, negative emission agriculture, or the idea is to reducing carbon emission from farm operations, sequestering carbon in terrestrial ecosystems, which means soil, trees, wetlands, mine lands, and degraded lands, no till. Again, this picture of my plot in uh, Africa, immediately after that erosion slide, I showed you very next cycle crop I followed, no tail. This was a 1971 picture. Uh, cowpeas, Vigna angiculata, growing in the residue of corn, and even on slope of up to 20% in those very highly erosive climate and very erodible soil there was absolutely no erosion. Although this was documented uh, uh, 50 plus years ago, the rate of uptake of this technology in Sub-Saharan Africa so far, maximum guesstimate is 1 million hectare. And I think we can do a lot better than that. The idea is that not only we should think about uh, uh, controlling erosion and conserving water, but as you know, at present, the fertilizer crisis, primarily because of the issue in Eastern Europe, uh, which that's where the fertilizer, uh, nitrogen and so forth uh, come from. So the question is, how do we minimize the dependence on chemical fertilizer? And once again, the idea is to grow as much carbon along with nitrogen in the soil legume, cover crop, mulching, recycling, compost, but the slogan should be C and PK. C comes before and PK, carbon, one form or the other. As the carbon concentration in the soil goes up to the optimum range that we were talking about earlier during this talk, uh, the dependence rate of NPK as a chemical fertilizer should decrease. Why? Because of the increase in efficiency, because of decrease in erosion, because of the other issue of uh, volatilization of nitrogen. So the focus should be on efficiency rather than on rate. And uh, efficiency means C. So always go C rather than NPK, should be C and PK. And if C comes from legumes, so much the better. The other part of tillage, uh, which I've just uh, said many good stories about it, uh, sometime if the measurements depth distribution of carbon is not done to, so let's say 50 centimeter or one meter, 
but only limited to the top 20 centimeter. The carbon concentration in no tail may look like this. And in a plow tail where the residue is plowed under at 20 centimeter depth, you will notice concentration in the no tail is higher in the surface part, but in a plow tail is higher in the deeper layer. So measuring carbon stock to deeper depth, at least to 50 centimeter, preferably to meter, occasionally, not every year, maybe every three years, is advisable. What is a climate resilient or climate smart agriculture? Uh, here is an example. We had an experiment in Nigeria, and I'm going to show you an example that is repeated in Shockton, Ohio. We had no-till plots since about 70s, 1970 at Shockton. In 2004, we started an experiment to take the, the, the crop residue, remove the crop residue from the no-till. So everything is no-till, uh, no plowing, fertilizer applied as normal, the improved varieties, and then we had a drought. 2012 was a very, very drought in Midwest, and Josh Peniston was doing his thesis research, that's him standing there, and uh, uh, we had compared this plot where the residue was taken away for eight years, compared with a plot exactly two meters away, but the residue was always kept in place. So if somebody asked me, what is a climate smart agriculture? This is it, you're looking at it. And you can make it more smarter if you also have, in addition to the residue produced there, you supplement by a cover crop in the off season. So return the residue, grow a cover crop in the off season, follow complex rotation uh, and do not disturb the ground. You got very close to climate smart agriculture. Why I said close because uh, the possibility of integration of crop with trees and livestock will make it even more smarter. Therefore, the negative emission agriculture really is like a bank account. In a bank account, your account will go up if you deposit more than what you withdraw. Soil is exactly like that. Your account of carbon in soil will go up if what you deposit into the soil as carbon currency is more than what you withdraw. What you withdraw from soil is, has to be calculated. And so that the idea of that is that you can, more than what is being removed, you can deposit into the soil. Biochar, compost, cover crop, all together must exceed erosion, leaching, decomposition. As long as what you add is more than what you're losing, you will have a positive balance and increasing. Unfortunately, most of the time, when people add some residue, maybe some root biomass, and they think it's enough, but it was not enough to compensate those losses, you create a negative budget. A negative budget, your soil bank account is continuously depleting. That is unfortunately the case with 500 million small landholders throughout the world, because they depend on their crop residue for many other things. How much the total technical potential of carbon sequestration soil of the world? if everything is managed properly, about 1.5 to 3.5 gigaton of carbon, average about 2.5 per year maximum. In addition to that, of course, uh, there's the inorganic carbon, which I did not uh, discuss more, how much it can be if you do properly, but biomass certainly plays a major role. In a few years back, 2015, 2017, several of us, about 15, 20 of us, got together and wanted to make an estimate, if we did everything right, between now and 2100, how much of drawdown can you create? Well, we can put back in the soils of all soils of the world, even mine soil, urban soil, agricultural soil, forest land soil, grazing land, all soil, about 178. There is a range, I can give you the average value. Similarly, vegetation, about 155. Total comes to until 2180 years, 333, which is a drawdown of atmospheric CO2 of 157 parts per million. Therefore, if we find no carbon fuel sources, and if we implement them soon, 
and at the same time adopt policy to recarbonize the biosphere. Remember 555 that we've taken away, out of which 333 we can put back, certainly. Then keeping global warming to less than two degrees centigrade is still possible. If we do not continue stopping, if we do not stop burning fossil fuel, land use by itself is a good thing, but not good enough. It will be good enough only if it is combined with no carbon fuel sources. The rate of carbon sequestration in no-till rangeland that I know ranges between 0.25 to about one ton of carbon per hectare. Wetland restoration is a better part. CRP does very good. I'll come back to that in a moment. So limiting global warming to two degrees centigrade. What is the recipe? Using no carbon or low carbon fuel, that's number one. Capturing and storing carbon, recarbonizing the land, rethinking the lifestyle, managing natural resources, transforming food systems. The whole summit two year was held, concluded last year in September by the Secretary General, changing the mindset and values and implementing pro-nature, pro-farmer, pro-agriculture policies. What do I mean by pro-policies? Let's think about a pyramid. And the base of this pyramid is the soil, the foundation on which everything depends. The global carbon stock, the global carbon pool, the soil depth, the top solar horizon, the four sides of the pyramid are the key ecosystem services, such as food security, nutrition security, such as climate change adaptation mitigation, such as water quality and renewability, biodiversity, all those good things. They are part of that base on which the pyramid is based. And the stability of this pyramid depends upon how the four side apex, where all those four sides meet, can be glued and cemented together so the pyramid doesn't fall apart. We need a strong base and something gluey strength, cementing substance to keep it together. And that would stabilize the pyramid. And that glue, that stability is the policy issues, is the human dimension, is the behavioral change. It is the pro-nature, pro-agriculture, pro-farmer policy I was talking about. Therefore, the importance of biophysical scientists working very closely with the socioeconomic and those people who make the policy issues. And this way we can do a lot of things. And that brings me to the other way to look at it as a three-legged stool, for example. We have a Clean Air Act of 67, Clean Water Act of 72. Uh, we certainly need a Healthy Soil Act, hopefully as soon as the next farm bill. And then what keeps those legs together and stool stable and agricultural sustainability is a policy, human dimension, implementing. The policy is to translate science into action. And that is a problem in many parts of the world where agriculture has stagnated or not made as progress is problem of translating science into action. One of the things to do that would be pay farmer the societal value of the ecosystem services. Some companies have started paying some, and I salute them for doing that. It's really very nice. But the real price, which I have been promoting since 2014, is about $35 per ton or a credit, $130 per ton of carbon. Therefore, if a farmer sequesters half a ton, $65 per hectare, 26 per acre. If farmers got a one third a ton, $43, $18. When you pay them $6, $4, $8, I don't think it does anybody any good. Undervaluing a very precious resource can lead to the tragedy of the common. And let's avoid that. If you want to pay, pay properly, fairly, justly, transparently, according to the societal value. I do know Obama government uh, started about $50 per ton of CO2 injecting into the ground. 
uh, now Biden government started the same thing, $50. That's one option. Let's keep both same. Uh, that would be a very good way to promote pro-farmer, pro-nature agriculture. Some of the limitations, uh, credible measurement of carbon stock changes, uh, uh, motivating hundreds of millions of landholders around the world, uh, payment to land manager, fair and just price, and making a provisions in the farm bill 23-24 for all those good things to do. The last thing I want to talk about is returning some land back to nature. And I'll begin with the statement that came from some Sir Albert Howard. He was the president of Indian Science Academy in 1920, 1918 to 1920. Sir Albert Howard was based on a city called Indore. And that is where his presidential address was, health of soil, plants, animal, and people is one and indivisible. That was the title of his talk. Health of soil, plants, animal, and people is one and indivisible. He was also the one who said, the law of return states that substance we take from nature must be returned to the place from which it was taken. And that says it all. If you keep taking everything from land, residue and graze it, do not put the manure back, do not put anything back, then that land is being uh, degraded, depleted, uh, devoid of nutrient, it cannot produce what you need it to produce. My suggestion, uh, which is obviously not going to be very popular, I know that, I'm very much aware of it, is to return a lot of land back to nature. Let me give you some example. Uh, fertilizer, we now use 200 million tons. In many countries in the world, the nitrogen use efficiency is between 20 and 30%. US maybe 45 to 50%. 200 million tons, if we improve the efficiency, I don't think we can ever, ever do without any fertilizer, but let's try to reduce it to half by 2050 and maybe go as little as 50 or somewhere between 150 by 2100. Cropland, Irrigated area, 350 million hectare right now. I think if we did drip fertigation and drip sub-irrigation, we could probably irrigate 750 million hectare of cropland and yet save water and save fertilizer together. Cropland area, we have 1,500 million hectare. Uh, I published an article about five years ago. Bobby Stewart uh, wrote another article uh, whether I was saying reducing 150, 100 to 750 and feed the world, he came back, yes, you can, uh, as long as we don't waste food. And that's a different topic. But I think 750 million hectare irrigated with drip fertigation should do us very well. What else? Rangeland, conservation agriculture. We have 200 million hectare out of 1,500. I think all 750 million hectare of cropland should be under conservation agriculture. No plowing, crop residue mulch, do not remove it, cover cropping, complex rotation, integrating crop with trees and livestock. Grazing land, we got 3,700 million hectare. I know very well that some of that rangeland is only good for rangeland. It can't be good for anything else. I know that. Do we need 3,700 million hectare? I don't think so. If we can manage 1,500, the best of them, leave the rest back to nature, it will do some good to everything else. Now, the water use. We use 3,150 kilometer cubed, 70% for agriculture. If we did fertigation, no flood irrigation, no sprinkler irrigation, no furrow irrigation, saving water, feeding plants drip by drip, Danny Hillel's method. I think we can get away with one third of water use and we can return at the same time uh, quite a lot of water and land back to nature. By doing so and by translating science into action, by filling the, the, the yield gap, by reducing waste of inputs and other things, 
we should be able to also, at least in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Caribbean, double, triple, quadruple the yield and return half of the land back to nature. Going back to uh, the law of return uh, the, of Sir Albert Howard, by 2100, we must return half of the current land and agriculture back to nature, reduce the food waste, narrow the crop yield gap, eat healthy diet, eat healthy diet, and promote urban farming, which is a soil-less production system. And that way, we do not have to encroach upon nature. Thank you very much. And Cynthia, congratulations once again. I'm very thoughtful to you uh, to be present today. And very uh, nice that we are having this in your honor. Thank Dr. you, Ritan, Long, for, thank this, you. for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much as well. Uh, just so much to unpack there. So many uh, deep lessons to, to think our way through. And thank you for uh, grounding us in that science of soil of biophysical processes and making that bridge to uh, watersheds and how the movement and nutrient loss as well as sediment loss can really impact what we're all trying to do in promoting carbon uh, smart agricultural practices.